Sonification is what I do for a living. And this means that I take scientific data sets and I translate them into sound. And I've been working at NASA in collaboration with the Solar Heliospheric Research Group here at the University of Michigan. And using our ears, we've been able to make new discoveries about the sun and the source regions of the solar winds. Now, the act of listening to scientific data and pulling out new features, it's kind of like sitting in a cocktail party where there are people talking all around you and you're able to focus on that one voice of the person sitting directly across from you. That's the power of the auditory system. And now, the subject matter that I'm talking about today, it's humbling because it's the source of all life on Earth. So in the interest of keeping things in perspective, without any further ado, I present the sun. <laughs> Now, the music you were just listening to is driven entirely by solar wind data. For instance, the bell sound that you hear, that actually represents explosions that are taking place on the surface of the sun. Now, those explosions known as coronal mass ejections get caught up in the solar wind. And the sun's atmosphere is literally so hot that it's unable to like, hang on to itself and it just blows itself out into space. And when these particles arrive at Earth, they have the capabilities of knocking out power grids and interrupting satellite communications. And they're probably most widely known for generating the aurora borealis, otherwise known as the Northern Lights. Now, in that animation that you were just watching, there was a scientist working with an artist together to make choices about how to represent, how to visualize those particles flying through space and how to represent the magnetic fields of Earth. Now, taking something that falls outside of the wavelength of visible light and pulling it in to the visible light spectrum, that's known as false color imaging. So here we see the galaxy M83. We have X-rays, radio waves, gamma rays, and they're now being pulled into the visible light spectrum such that we can appreciate them with our eyes. And as a sonification specialist, I do something very similar except with the ears. Now you're probably wondering one very important question, and that is, is there a symphony orchestra on the surface of the sun? The answer is no, <laughs> of course. But we can use sound to free up our eyes so that we can just listen and sort of ambiently monitor what's taking place in the solar environment. And the orchestra is just one example. I want to play another example of you now. It's a different way of representing the solar wind. Here, I've taken the velocity, so the speed at which the solar wind is flowing, and I've mapped it onto the cutoff frequency of a filter that's placed over pink noise. So essentially, we get a sound that sounds very similar to terrestrial wind here on Earth. And you don't have to be told when the wind picks up when it's rustling through the trees outside your window. You have an intuitive sense for how this works. And in this way, by using this kind of intuitive mappings, we can use data sets that are translated into sound to inform us about things that are taking place way off in space that otherwise may be very abstract and esoteric. Now, what I've been talking about now, up until now, is using sound to represent data in a sort of musical fashion, but we can also listen directly to the digital data set. Now, how many people have listened directly to digital data as a show of hands? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and play an example for you guys now. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Now, this might not be what you were expecting. It's indeed a data set, so this is my Aunt Beth and my cousin Julia singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And if you think about what's going on here, they're singing, and then the microphone is a transducer, and it picks up the changes in air pressure, translates that into an audio file, so it's a stream of ones and zeros that we can play back over speakers or headphones. So this is indeed a data set, and I actually think that this is quite a beautiful data set. And many of the scientific data sets that I've been working with, I also think are quite beautiful. So before I take us to the sun and walk you guys through some of the discoveries that we've made, I'm gonna show you something that we've recorded here on Earth. Any guesses to what the sound might be? 
So what we're listening to there is a magnitude six earthquake that was recorded in Petrolia, California. And if you think about it, the seismograph, the needle is moving back and forth. So essentially what we've done, it's a process known as audification. We've taken that raw tracing and we've just sped it up and played it back over speakers. What we're listening to is that raw data. It actually sounds kind of organic, right? It almost sounds like someone striking a drum head. And if you think about what's taking place with an earthquake, it's almost as though the entire crust of the earth is this very thin membrane. It's almost stretched over the inner layers of the earth like a taut drum head. And so then the earthquake is just this impulsive energy. And so it's actually not that surprising that an earthquake does indeed sound kind of similar to a drum being struck. And this hum that you're listening to now, this was recorded from the depths of space. What we're listening to here are binary star observations. And a binary star system is one in which you have one star rotating around another. And because of this rotation, you have a periodic rise and fall in the brightness of the light that comes off the system. So when you speed up that signal, that becomes this underlying hum. Now you also hear this tone going up and down. Now I made a decision about how to map this same data set so that we can hear that brightness as a sort of sine wave that just rises and falls. So close your eyes if it helps and just listen to that tone. So if you think about it, what we're listening to, it's kind of like an organ that's describing what's happening out in the cosmos right now at this very minute. And I got kind of excited when I was creating these sounds and exploring what was possible. And I thought, what else can I do with this data? And so I threw a beat behind it. And right now, all the tonal content that you're hearing is still driven directly by binary star observations. dealing with the digital data set still. So we have all the tools that a DJ might use right at our fingertips so we can take out, let's say, the low frequencies. Let's adjust the high frequencies. We can add it back in. We can also cut out the high frequencies. So now we just hear that low thump of the bass drum. We can add the high frequencies back in. So one really important question is, what did we learn from this? And the answer is, nothing. <laughs> but it's really fun to make techno music from binary star observations. <laughs> And that brings up a really important point because we're walking this beautiful line between science and art. And as a composer, there are so many different things that I want to do with these data sets. And I'm really aware of my own compositional tendencies and these own ideas that you know, I have and the things that I want to hear. But I'm also really interested in listening to the raw, the natural voice of the sun. So keeping that in mind, I'm now going to play you some examples of raw solar data. Now, in comparison, this is going to sound very turbulent, very chaotic, and that's because we're listening to the sun here. It's a very turbulent, very dynamic system. What we're listening to here is 45 years worth of solar wind velocity measurements compressed down into an eight-second audio file. Now, I'm going to go ahead and bring it up the octave, so I'm going to play it back twice as fast. Right there, it sounds very noisy, right? Now, close your ears, or close your eyes <laughs> again if it helps. <laughs> Keep your ears open. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the high frequency turbulence. When we listen more closely, we can start to hear this underlying hum. And what might be causing a hum in 45 years worth of solar observations? To answer that question, I'm going to pull up another audio example real quick. What we're listening to now kind of has a similar hum, but this is a garden variety electrical generator. And when we slow down the sound, something very interesting happens. <laughs> what we were hearing is one continuous frequency just a moment ago, 
we can now hear as a series of independent, discrete events. So that continuous frequency was actually comprised of very equally spaced firings of that piston. And when we speed it back up then, the frequency will return. So let's go back to the solar data now. So what might be causing that hum in this solar data? So what we're actually listening to are surface features that persist across multiple solar rotations. So the satellite observes one observation, right? And then the sun spins around. 27 days later, you get, bam, another packet of information. 27 days later, bam, another packet. And it spins and it says, hey, hello, how are you? Very evenly, every 27 days, we have an observation. Over the course of 45 years, that then becomes a continuous hum. And when you listen more closely, you can actually hear a rise and fall in the intensity of this hum. That relates back to something known as the solar cycle. It's an 11-year cycle with a rise and fall in solar activity. And this was actually the first thing that I heard when I audified these data sets and started listening. And I started thinking to myself, what else might I hear? And so I started looking through NASA's data repository and the terabytes worth of data. They became almost like a large record collection that was just kind of waiting for me to dig through. So here's what I pulled up next. And in that example, you can hear that very similar underlying hum. It does indeed sound very similar to what I was just playing, except now we're listening to the charged state of carbon. So I'm going to let you guys be the auditory analysts now. We're going to compare this example, this would be example one, with example two. Now I know that it's really noisy, and maybe this isn't what you guys are used to listening to, but close your eyes and really listen closely. We're going to go to the optometrist's office. I'm going to say, better example one or example two. So which one has more of a present hum and which one is more noisy? Example one or example two? OK, so I'm going to return back to example one. In listening to this data, which wasn't really being used at the time, we were actually able to determine that the hum was more prevalent here than it was in some other data sets that were being very highly used. And then in following up with some uh, modeling of the atomic physics and through some additional investigation, we actually determined that this data was a better indicator of the source region of the solar wind, so where the solar wind was coming from on the sun. And so this was that first discovery that we were actually able to make by using our ears. So then I went back to that record collection. I'll show you guys what I pulled up next. What we're listening to now, it's qualitatively very different from what I was playing before. The first thing that you'll notice is that underlying hum is now gone. This almost sounds like a flag waving in the wind. And that's because we are actually listening to the solar winds. What we're listening to here are very high resolution magnetic field measurements. What we're listening to here is eight hours worth of measurements compressed down into just eight seconds of audio. 300,000 data points that go by your ear in eight seconds. Now, in listening through a whole lot of different data for many, many hours, suddenly one thing jumped out at me, and it was this whooshing sound. Suddenly, rather than hearing that flag waving in the wind, it almost it sounded very, very qualitatively different. So I turned to my colleague, Dr. Rob Wicks, and said, you know, what's going on here? And it turns out that what we're listening to is known as an ion cyclotron wave storm. That's one of the coolest things I had heard in a while. <laughs> ion cyclotron wave storm. And we have a very uh, limited understanding currently about exactly how often these occur in the solar wind, how intense they are, and where they take place. 
And in this instance, it turns out that using our ears is a more highly effective method to scan through large amounts of data and to pull out this specific type of feature. So I'm going to go ahead and play for you guys now one example where we don't really know exactly what's going on. Almost sounds like aliens cackling or something. It's wild. So we haven't actually heard any extraterrestrial life as of yet. <laughs> if we do, I'll let, you, I'll let uh, everyone know. <laughs> But it brings up an important point, because this work isn't just about making scientific discoveries. It's also about figuring out how to integrate this auditory technique into the workflow of research scientists. It's about figuring out the exact types of features that are usually overlooked and yet are readily accessible to the ear. And we also shouldn't forget that we don't have to choose if we want to use our ears or our eyes. We can use the two in tandem. Now, Robert Persick said in the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, that there's a lot of blind data gathering in the sciences because there's no real understanding of scientific creativity. And that there's a lot of stylishness in the arts because there's no connection back to underlying form. And that the time for the reunification of art and science is long overdue. And if music is a universal language, then perhaps sound provides a universal platform for scientific discovery. Thank you.